Yeah, go ahead. What's the bio? Oh, what? Want to do the for these computers? No idea. This is a new lab. All right, guys, uh, let's get started. Uh, so as you can see, I got the whiteboard to work. All right, um, so we are going to begin uh, on the agenda. I think it's recording already, actually, right? You guys can see it is recording somehow. It's recording, right? Okay, so... Um, on the agenda today, we're going to do two things. Um, we started doing this on um, Tuesday, which is basically going over the word problems. Okay, so the, this part of the class does not require any coding or any anything like that. We're just going to look at problems and we're going to learn this or perform this exercise of creating this X and Y, right? So it's kind of like this recipe approach that I'm trying to give you of how to take any problem and try to make it more into something that's a format like for machine learning. Okay, so that's going to be uh, what we're going to do today. We're going to go over as many exercises as we can of that. And hopefully by seeing those exercises and the approach, you'll understand how to tackle it. Then I will give you between three and five problems as a homework assignment. So I haven't written the problems yet. I'll probably do that tomorrow. And so look for those um, by the end of tomorrow. And then you'll have a week to complete it. All right, for that homework. You can use your favorite digital tool, or you can just take a sheet of paper, do it on there and take a picture. It doesn't matter to me as long as I can read um, that you have a solution there. Remember, it's very open-ended. There's no right or wrong solution per se. It's more about the procedure, right? So seeing the common things in the procedure. We'll definitely do a cyber-related one, cybersecurity one, so you can see um, the approach. And then, like I said, I'll, I'll make three problems at least for you to uh, do. So that's uh, part of today that's on the agenda. And then the second part will be to install Anaconda or hopefully you, you were supposed to install Anaconda. So basically using Anaconda, right? So remember that's gonna be our environment pretty much for the whole um, semester. And so I will go over creating an environment and installing some of the libraries and Jupyter and maybe get you know some functionality going. So that's really, you will need Anaconda next week as we will start going over the NumPy review, right? Which is really important. So vectors and matrices, we'll go over some of those operations. And then remember, I'll give you a set of exercises for you to develop like muscle memory on these concepts, you know, how to make these operations. So you just have to like, you know, get used to these operations that we want to perform for efficiency, okay? And then as we start writing algorithms, et cetera, you'll start to see how nice they are and they'll make more sense. Okay. So um, the very first algorithm that we will implement for machine learning will be KNN. As I said, the K nearest neighbor algorithm will implement that in pure NumPy and uh, you should be able to see how it works. And that's gonna be a, a machine learning algorithm. Okay, so yeah, so today, um, basically the plan is to go over the problems. So on Tuesday, I gave the intro for the class. We went over uh, the syllabus, kind of the what the course is about, some of the potential projects, et cetera. All right, before I begin, are there any questions? I'm doing the sign-in sheet for the course participation uh, that I need to report in about three or four weeks. All right, so I have the whiteboard here, which is what I'll be doing, but I wanna go to the uh, Brightspace environment just to remind you where these problems live, I go to the content section. And remember that we are here, right? So the very first module for this week, and this is the second module, third week will be Weka, which is a really nice tool. So please don't, I think I showed you the link where the Weka is, is in the course page. Please install that as well, if you have your laptop so we can have it available 
it's a nice one of your one of the tools that you want to have in your toolkit for machine learning. Okay. All right. So let's take a look here at um, the machine learning pipeline and feature engineering. So we went over, I think, um, the PDF document on Tuesday, which was basically what is the machine learning pipeline? What do I mean by that? What are the parts of it? It's pretty much what we're doing all semester. At the end of the day, we get something called a model. All right. That's the thing that we extract. That was that circle. So we build a pipeline, we develop it. And once the model is trained, we extract it from there and then we can use it for inference for our applications. Thanks. All right. So today we're going to continue going uh, over these problems. So I so I have two. These two are just examples that I have that I've accumulated over the years. And, you know, um, so these are these the ones you find here are only problems for the class, I will give you an actual new set of problems for the whole, okay? Because these are previous semester problems. All right, so I think we started with this one last Tuesday. So then let's start with this one uh, today. And I'll just, I think I have a, a cybersecurity one here. Okay, so I'm gonna click on this. Okay, so. Yeah, so we have one. So we have several problems here um, uh, that we can think of. So remember, again, the pipeline for this is, you know, the, the question is something like this. You have these problems, which are all a type of classification problem. Okay, so we need to make a distinction as to what is classification, what is regression. There are various things that, you know, ways that, you know, different kinds of problems that we can address. But for, for now, all, most of these are classification, I believe. Um, so the procedure that I'm trying to discuss is you have any kind of problem, right? And how do you begin to collect the data and to decide what kind of model you're going to use, okay? So usually, as you will see in the code, all the time, <clears throat> we have a ton of functions, et cetera, to process data, but we always end up with an X and a Y. That those are very common variables that you would find everywhere. And basically they mean the sample data and then what it is that you're trying to predict. So you're finding correlations usually with between the row in X and the corresponding row in Y, right? That's pretty much what's happening in machine learning. So we want to identify the X matrix uh, we want to identify the Y vector. We want to define what is the sample. Somebody asked that very important question, right? What is a sample? And that, that's actually, it's almost like a profound thing in machine learning, right? You have to decide, you know, what is my sample? You have to really think about that. Then so, some are easy, like what are the classes? Uh, you want to define what are the features that sometimes is obvious and sometimes that's really difficult, okay? Uh, you want to define the dimensions of X and Y. So once you get to a point where you can, as we did in the first example, you know the dimensions of X and Y, you're you know, in pretty good shape. As, as you know, everything is a matrix or a vector in machine learning. So everything has dimensions and you know, it's very structured. And we want to indicate what they mean. All right, so some of the uh, problems that we have here, I have, I guess, seven here. Um, so one is a classification model for finding guns and images posted on Facebook. So this may be something that actually Facebook wanted to do, right? So they wanted to find, you know, violence or things like that in images to people load. And so they were scanning the images. Why can they do that? This is a good uh, example, actually, because Facebook has how many users does it have? Probably a billion or three billion or something like that. It's, it's getting to that. Now imagine three billion, let's say two billion people posting images on Facebook every day. And also when they post something, they put like, oh, this is my picture of so-and-so. You know, I had fun at the gun range or something. So all that information is gonna help Facebook to develop good models. Why? Because they have massive amounts of data. That's really important. That's actually really important for deep learning to work. Deep learning is very data hungry. So it needs lots of data, okay? That's what it's called actually big data. But this is why 
you know, all the breakthroughs that you see started with the big companies like Facebook, Google, et cetera, because they have all this data available. They have a lot of computing power. They have also very smart people, right? Developing these algorithms. So all of this comes and they have a lot of money. And so, and they make money, right? Also, so, you know, they, all this comes together to develop very powerful models, okay? But anyway, this is one of the tasks that we could look at. Uh, another task might be a model to identify suspects in a murder case. So this is more, you know, you have to make some assumptions here, right? We can define, you know, maybe your police department. So then, you know, you have suspects. How do you even begin to do it, right? So this is not images per se also. Not everything is a picture. Sometimes this is just information. So this is just a scenario where you might be hired by a police station or the FBI or something, and they want you to help them out. So how do you begin to do this, right? That's the whole point. Remember, we're just thinking of the process, right? There can be, you can, you all can have many approaches that you take, right? Because you, we all think different. Now, a classification model for movie recommendations, such as Netflix, this is actually implemented everywhere. Amazon has one of these, Netflix has one of these, right? And they want these to work really well because they want to show you a movie and they want you to look at it. Or Amazon wants to show you a product and they want you to buy it. They're wasting time if they show you a product and you don't buy it, right? That their algorithm doesn't work because at the end of the day, they just want to increment their revenue, all right? So they have a very strong interest in something like this work. And this is a complex thing. Obviously, we can try to approach it with what we know, but for something like that, there may be a more advanced technique to follow, okay? So there are specific solutions for certain things. There's actually something called recommender systems, which is specific for uh, this kind of thing. Uh, so today, we're in, I'm not gonna obviously go into like the very complex techniques. Instead, we're just trying to arrive at what is X and Y, right? And from, from there, we would think of some algorithm. A classification model for weather monitoring. I think this is a good one, right? This is a, an easy one that we can all intuitively think about. All right, so this might be one that we uh, try today. Um, a classification model for cancer diagnosis using 3D image scans. So this is like image processing, but it's going to be more. It's like three-dimensional, right? So you have multiple things to look at. Um, a classification model for de to detect sentiment in images. I like this one. <laughs> All examples in machine learning are usually something about sentiment analysis, right? So it's a very common thing that people uh, intuitively try to do. So we'll probably tackle this one. And then, as I said, you guys are mostly cybersecurity students, so I'll throw in as many cybersecurity data sets as I can. And seven uh, is a classific classification model to detect attacks in network data. Okay, so I will start with this one, actually. Number seven uh, for today. So we'll do this as a word problem uh, and just try to solve it. Make sense? All right, so you guys can help me out. I'm going to open it here in my other computer just so I can uh, remember what it is that we need to do. Okay, and then, as I said, when you do the homework assignment, just, you know, if you forget all the details, just remember, give me X and Y and the dimensions. And by doing that, you're answering pretty much all the other questions, right? You need to provide, you know, how everything is. By by justifying the numbers that you put there, you're really saying, okay, this is this, this is that, and so on. All right, so I'm going to switch now to the uh, whiteboard. So that you have a recording of this. I wasn't able to record this. All right, so we are doing a classification model to detect attacks in network data. So this is, we have to think of what the data is, right? So network data means packets, correct? Would you agree we're talking about packets? You guys have taken uh, or will take 454, your network security courses, et cetera, and you've taken a, a lot of like Wireshark or Scappy or something like that. So you know that getting packets is doable, right? You can your peak out files, for instance. So that's the data in this case that we have to look at and we have to define certain things. So we want the X and the Y, right? We want 
X. I use uppercase X because it's a matrix and you use lowercase Y because it's a vector, usually a column vector. So what are we trying to do? It's a classification model. So it's not a regression model. Remember regression gives you real valued numbers like 32 degrees or 34 degrees or 37 degrees. Classification just means several classes. And you usually want to keep that to a, a low number, usually not more than like 20 classes. That's, I would think that's too many actually. So, but common data sets have like 10 classes like MNIST, which is one of the data sets that we will look at. SciFAR 10, which might be the challenge, the competition later in the semester might be based on SciFAR 10. So that's also 10 classes. All right, so uh, it's a classification model to detect attacks in network data. Okay, so we we would probably have PCAP files. PCAP files, right? Assume we are using something like Scappy or Wireshark to collect our data, okay? So remember, we need to train a model, right? So there's gonna be a model. We don't have to worry about what algorithm we're gonna use. We could use Naive KNN, Deep Neural Networks, any one of those, as long as we put the data in the format of X and Y, actually it'll fit in Weka like right away. So that's really good. Now, remember the one thing is that everything needs to be a number here. It can't be words or things like that, right? So, okay. So what do we know about this problem? We have inputs going in and we have outputs, right? For the model. What are the outputs? Yes, please. Uh the different types of attacks or if the attack or not. Right, exactly. It, it could be different types of an attack. That's a perfectly good one if you if you wanted to do that for the homework. Hey, yeah, just justify it. Or it's perfectly fine if you just say attack, not attack. Attack, not attack is perfectly fine. So I would go with that because it's easier to think about. So I would say attack and not attack. Okay. So that's going to be, let's say, zero and one. That's it. So you you really just have a classifier that says it's a zero or a one attack, not attack. Okay, so that's good. So here then we can start populating our X and Y. Zero, zero, one, one, zero, dot, dot, dot. You see that? We've got that piece of information already. We need to define what the features are. Remember that we we want to be consistent with the language so that we all know really quickly what we're saying. So we would say things like feature one, feature two, dot, 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 feature N. Okay? We want to know, or M, I think I had used initially M here. And then here, this would be N, which is what? We said that the rows are usually the number of samples, right? So remember, so we have to answer that almost profound question, which sometimes is very easy and sometimes is really hard. What is a sample? You see that? Sometimes this is really obvious, like in pictures, a picture is a sample, right? But here, not so obvious, right? Because, you know, does it even make sense? You know, what makes sense here? All right, what else do we need? Obviously, if we if we know this value, then we know the value of this vector because they need to be the same. Remember that these are samples. So we have, let's say, sample one, sample two, and this row then corresponds to one row in the vector. And those have to be perfectly aligned. You have to be very careful with you with your code because if you ever misalign these, you're basically giving it garbage. Garbage in, garbage out, right? So make sure that these are always aligned. So we have, what do we know about PCAP files? They contain packets, right? What do we know about packets? We have what, UDP packets, TCP packets. They all have an IP header, an ethernet header, something like that, right? So we have that information. So here, if you're not a network person or an IT student, you need to partner up with somebody that is, right? So that they can give you that insight. On Tuesday, we did the example of the, uh, furnace, the steel mill furnace, right? So there you need to partner up with somebody that knows about such things, right? So in this case, all of you, this should be familiar or will be more familiar to you in time, but well, in your 170 class, you learn about all the headers and all that stuff, right? So we can think of it. So we've got, let's, let's keep it simple. So we can make some assumptions, right? So we've got ethernet, 
IP header, and then it could be UDP or TCP. To keep things simple, we can stay with TCP and just drop UDP packets. Um, that's your, let's say this is just your first run of the model. And then later on, you're gonna develop maybe one that includes UDP packets, something like that. But for now, let's keep it there. And then we'll have like a payload kind of thing, which is much more difficult to deal with. It almost becomes like a language problem at this point because the payload actually carries information, right? Uh, and so that can be text, you know, little characters, uh, uh, hexadecimal, et cetera, which is actually very relevant to network attacks, right? Like buffer overflow attacks and things like that. So that's a bit more challenging to deal with because it's almost like language. Right? Uh, the other thing that we, of course, have to consider is that the data cannot be encrypted. Okay, this is a big important thing. Now, obviously, does it does it make sense here? It makes sense because inside a company's network, right? They the information comes in encrypted, but then they're gonna uh, it's gonna become unencrypted and then within their networks, right? And then they can scan. What's the problem with encrypted data? Yeah, go. Ahead. Um, it because it's encrypted, but. If you want to get to the definition of Claude Shannon, right, it's because in theory it should be random. It, right, but because it should be random, right? You should not be able to say anything about um, an encrypted packet, right? You, you should, it's, it's random. You should be as much as possible. So it should be very difficult to break. So that means there are no patterns. If actually the definition of cryptography is if there's a pattern in there, it's not good cryptography. But machine learning is doing what? It's looking for patterns. You see that? So, so this, by definition, should not work if you have a good encryption. All right. So anyway, so that's a very important assumption, right? Now, there are people, obviously, that try to deal with encrypted data, and there are techniques for that, but it's special types of encrypted encrypting algorithms, not like RSA or something like that. It's, it's different approaches. But anyway, here we have one assumption, your data is unencrypted. Okay, we have a few headers, right? We also know that it's an attack or not an attack. So we have to figure out how we collect this data. That's a big challenge there, okay? So let's start there. How do we collect attack data versus not attack data? So imagine we have a, a network, like, you know, a comp let's say the university, right? It's got networks. Right, and these networks have packets running through them. Correct? You would agree that that's happening. Out of those, out of all of those packets, how many of those would you say are related to attacks? What percentage? Hopefully not fifty percent, right? Because you know we're not being attacked all the time. In fact, right now it could be zero. Would you agree that it could be zero? Right? Right now, most of the traffic could be. Let's call it good traffic, easy, you know, nothing. What is good traffic? You guys are emailing, you guys are going on um, websites, you're doing all that stuff. So protocols, services, right? So that information is stored in the TCP headers, right? So let's think port numbers, for instance, you know, port 80. So here we can start to dig in a little bit into features, right? Because we know We've got port 80, we've got port 22. Um, give me an, a couple more here. 23, what's another one? 24, yeah. So, right, well, I mean, that are used commonly. 443, that's it, but that's gonna be encrypted data, right? But it still came from that. Yeah. Anyway, you, you have some numbers here, right? So you start to think about, you're, you're the machine learning engineer here. So you have to find features that are useful, okay? So port numbers. So, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that F1 is related to port numbers. It doesn't necessarily have to be the port number, but this is associated with services, correct? What about IPs? Is, would that be useful for attack, not attack? Yes, probably. Probably. Okay. All right. So certain IPs from certain countries. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. So maybe an IP address, right? You now remember that this IP address 
you need to take like a number representation of it, okay? But that you don't have to worry about for this. We just have to remember here, we're just doing feature engineering and you need to tell me at the end of the day what M is. You know, you, you, you did like you think about this and you're gonna say, I'm gonna start with these features. That makes sense for me. Now there is information in the payload, right? Could there be useful information in the payload? The size, okay, that's a good one, right? Because that's an easy one to get. Number of bytes sent, I think it's called something like that, right? So let's say over here, F3, a number of bytes sent, number of bytes received. Yeah, number. Of now, if you guys remember from your buffer overflow attacks, right? That, you know, you have like hexadecimal things in there, right? There's one common thing called a knob sled. I don't know if you remember, 0x90, I think it is maybe, yeah? So 0x90, right, is a sequence of hexadecimal symbols, right, that represent like a common type of an attack. Yeah, good, do you have a question? Oh, no, yeah, and so you could say, okay, if I can look at the payload and I find not just one of these, but maybe like 10 or 20 of these, that might be a good feature. Does that make sense? So this is just an example of payload because this can be a lot of things and can get more complicated. All right. So anyway, we have maybe four. We're going to say something from the payload, some information, something simple, like we run a function through it and we find if this is present a lot in the payload. And so that also becomes a feature. So maybe present, not present. Okay. All right. Yeah, go ahead, please. Can the speed be a factor? The speed of what? Transfer. How fast it's moving? Well, you could you might say so. This bring what I what that makes me think of like a denial of service attack maybe, and that might be something that um, there's speed in there because you're getting a, a flood of attacks, right? A flood of packets. So you then may want to. This actually gets into what is a sample. Yeah, go ahead. I guess another one could probably. I don't know if it would work, but quantify what he said. Maybe like. The time interval between the first, the first and second packet. Ah, the same IP. I like your way of thinking because now we need your. You made it absolutely necessary for us to go here. What is a sample? You see what I'm saying? The simplest thing for me is to make every packet a sample. That's the easiest thing. That that's where I would want to start because that's easy, right? Take a packet, convert it into a vector of twenty features or forty features. But you thought about this idea. You all started thinking about this idea. I was just trying to clock. Yeah, I if you have a denial of service attack, right? Now you have, it's a fast thing, right? So in one minute, you'll get thousands of packets, right? So that information might also be important. But that means that you have to uh, make a decision. Do I want samples to be just one packet? Or do I want samples to be something like, like all the packages might be just that idea. I would say more like the simplest thing, because you can have many ideas for sam for samples, but I would say look all the packets that I collected in a minute. So you define a time window now. So your device will say at from zero to one minute, I collect all these packets and I'm gonna make a sample out of that. Then from minute one to two, I'm gonna collect all these packets and make a sample out of it. But then you have to think how you're going to do that because you might have a thousand packets during that minute. And in other situations, you may have 10, right? So what do you do? What's the easiest thing? Average, averaging them probably. But you may also lose information. You see, so there's, there's all these challenges. It's not so straightforward to do. And so I would recommend for this example, let's just say that each packet is a sample. Okay, but you can, if you wanted to do something like every minute, then the easiest thing is just to collect whatever, however many packets you get there. They're all that's why they're all TCP. They all have similar fields. Average them. Do you see that? How if you've received a thousand packets in that? How many of them? Now it's a thing of how many of them had this in. Them. So maybe that's one feature. And another feature is, did I actually see this at any time? Making sense, guys? 
So this is all called feature engineering and it's a very challenging thing. That's like, you have to, that's where your work comes in. You have to like analyze. All right, so, but anyway, so that's the problem, right? So now let's go back to kind of finish it up. So we have a few features and you've seen that it's challenging. How, if we continue to do that though, how many features do you think we would end up with in the end? What makes sense? Yeah. Not zero. <laughs> Not zero, right. But 1 million features, 1,000 features, 200 features. 20 or 40 features. That's actually, to me, that seems reasonable. So then I would say that we go to F40. Remember, it's about the dimensions of this, right? Um, <clears throat> now, samples, N. How many packets can you collect? 100 millions, right? So this could be really large. Yeah? Okay. I like, okay. So let's say, let's say 100,000, which is the same as this number. We're almost done. Yeah, you have a question? Good question. Would you get diminished returns after so many sample sizes? That's a good question, actually. Um, so the, is, is it, you know, if we get to a million, do we need 10 million? If we right, get like to 10 million, do we need a bit? Let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. The growing, the consensus currently with, at least with GPTs, which are transformers, large language models, the really big things that you hear about is the bigger, the better. So more data, more computing power, more architecture, more parameters, better models. So then the next one is more data, bigger, you know what I mean? So the big, so that's what people have observed, at least with the large language models. It may be for some smaller models that you get to a point where you have enough data, but yeah. Got it? Yeah, thank you. All right, great. So there's just one last thing with this. We're all, we're done, right? So if you could say, you know, you have your X and Y, you already, this is one, right? You agree that this is what, just give me a sec. This is one. You agree that this is 40 and you agree that this is 100,000. So you've given me the dimensions, you've defined the sample packet, et cetera. There's only one more thing that I need to address, but yeah, what's your question? Well, what you said previously about yes. like how more data is better. Didn't you mention that in the pipeline or that information in the pipeline that scaling is very important? But I meant scaling of the vi values themselves. So for instance, what I mean, just to answer your question, let's say that F1 is port numbers. So port numbers go from zero to 65,000, correct? All right, so you would have F1, if we imagine this as a 3D, 3D space, imagine that this is F1. So the values would range from zero to 65,000 here. But then I might have another feature F1, Three, that is, does it contain any 0x90s, yes or no? That range goes from what? Zero to one. That's what I mean by scaling. You don't want the this something like this because in some models, this is, you're gonna, you have more range here than you do here. And so this is gonna dominate the other features. So what you do is you scale them so that this becomes also from zero to one. And every value here is going to be proportional to that scale. Do you know what I mean? That's what I meant by scaling or normalization. All right, but great question, is, but because that's something we need to address. Now, the last problem we have is, how, which you've answered the question now. You've answered your homework, it's done. But we have one problem. How do we collect the data? You want to think about this, right? Yeah, go ahead. You got it, mind you. You data mine your, you, you have a data center, you're saying you own, let's say that's a good example. You own a data center, right? A huge one. So you have a lot of traffic, right? But a lot of that is good traffic, right? Maybe 95% of that is good traffic. And then 5% of or less is attacks, actual attacks. And you're not going to have that many, right? So that's the issue. How do you collect the data? So what would be one simple way of doing it? On a Monday, right? You got your uh, Wireshark, and you just monitor the traffic. You got, or, yeah, or one day. Let's just say one day. So you have one packet, and there was no attack associated with it, so it gets the class zero, right? And this packet 
will go into a function that extracts the features. And there you go. And it gives you 40 features. So you do this over Monday. That's, e that's the easy case. What about when you have a tax, which is a one? Do you equate the tax set? Hmm? Like, do you, do you say that? How do you, but how do you get an attack? That's what I'm asking. Yeah, go ahead, please. You simulate one. That I like that. That's a good one because, you know, you're assuming that you have a really good intrusion detection system or something. And okay, and that's good. If it flags it, then you get a lot of false positives sometimes. So some expert has to look at that. And that's very expensive. You see that? But you can do simulation. So, you know, you go on a Wednesday and you basically, what are your tools for attacking, right? You know, like your... Hmm? Denial, of denial of service right so you 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 know you get like scappy or you get some other tool right and um cali linux i think you guys saw those attacks right and on that wednesday from one to two you start launching attacks right and you know that's an attack and you collect that data you see that and then you simulate multiple types of attacks so at the end of the day now you have like this bucket of packets that you can associate with the class one and you have this other bucket of uh, packets that you associate with the class here. Do you see that? And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna feed the model this data and it has to learn to distinguish between attack and not attack. The only problem with, well, with a simulation, you can generate a lot of data. That's, so definitely we could get a lot of data, but in general, this is gonna be what is called an imbalanced data set. Okay, because you usually have more good traffic than bad traffic. Imbalanced data is actually problematic for machine learning. Machine learning likes balanced data. You'll see in a lot of the examples we do, it's always like class one has 100, class two has 100. But in reality, you're not going to get that. That's the problem. The other problem with synthetic data is that synthetic. So it's not exactly, it's based on you being an expert in, in doing attacks, right? And so the, the better you are at attacking, the more diverse that data set is. But in general, you know, you're not gonna end up with that many examples. Yes, go ahead. In data sets, are there like control variables and uh, tested? Like, as you said, you simulated that area, but we have a control variable somewhere else. No. For what? What do you want to control so variable? Like, imagine on Monday, you get the set of packets mm -hmm. uh, from that time I and mean, once they simulated yes but in a real world scenario it's going to be different even while you're simulating you still get oh that you're packets. you're mean you're meaning that if you're attacking this network somebody's still emailing and, and googling and yeah that's a good question so you have to be careful with that because otherwise you're going to be inserting in their good packets and that's going to confuse the model really confuse it so so I, I get your 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 question now. You want to put some parameter in the packet so that you know that's the packet for the attack. That's a good idea. What I would just say is just don't run anything in the network. That's good um, good traffic as much as possible. And then just do the attack packets, basically. Because it's a very, very, very good question. You're going to confuse the model if you're giving it that, let's say that denial of service attack, but there's also some, you know, Google's, you know, Google search going on in there. But the problem is you have labeled that Google search as a one, as an attack when it wasn't. You see that? So you got to be careful with that. Okay. So it's a it's a difficult problem, which again is what I was trying to emphasize. Getting that data is difficult. Okay. The the attack data, the good data is is more easy. So. You know, one way is, as I said, there's an you have an intrusion detection system. It flags a lot of things. An expert human looks at it and says, these seven were not an attack, but these three are. So those three, you're sure, is high quality data of attack. The other one is the simulated data, but just be careful not to run other data as well so that you don't enter that and confuse the model. Got it? That's pretty much it as far as the exercise uh, for this one. Uh, do you guys have any questions on, on how to do it? Remember, I will give you any kind of problem, right? And so this is a cybersecurity one where the medium is, is um, packets. 
and the 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 x is a hundred thousand by forty, and the y is a hundred thousand by one. Is that clear for everyone? And we define a sample as just a packet, although you saw that it could have been something. Questions. All right, so let's do another one. Then. All right. Oh yeah, go ahead. I mean, had we done this slightly differently, if this was the homework, mm -hmm. you know, it's not like right or wrong. It's just it, okay. exactly. There, no, yeah, exactly. Just state your assumptions. That's basically, I'm just looking for this process that if you said 100,000, why did you say 100,000? If you said 20, I would question that because I would say, well, I think you can get more than 20 packets, you know, something like that. So, but there may be another scenario, like if you have to collect specimens of a plant, a rare plant, you're not, and you told me, oh yeah, I'm going to get 100,000 of that. Well, probably you can't because it's really expensive just to get one. You see that? So that's really what you have to think about as you're trying to define your uh, your data. But yeah, great question. Right, so there's, yeah. Okay, so let's try another one. So let me um, stop sharing. Let's go back to the, let's go back to the document here. All right, what's a good one here? I think I had identified one. Oh, the weather one, right? We can well. Let's do an image one. Actually, I don't think. What did we do last? Oh, we we haven't done an image one. So let's do an image one. Actually, we haven't done. It. So let's do. Huh? You want to do the gun one? A model for finding guns and images posted on Facebook. Okay. Okay. So, on images, yeah. So let's do that one. Okay. All right, so let's go here, back to the right corner, okay? All right, so image problems are like the classical thing in machine learning. Machine learning almost like started deep learning with images, okay? Uh, the, the whole breakthrough was in 2012, right? At um, ImageNet, the ImageNet competition. And that was basically, you would get a lot of images and you had to classify it into different things like, you know, bus, car, whatever, right? So it was an image competition, right? And so <clears throat> there's a lot of MNIST, the data set that we will use is images and SciFAR 10 is images and images are pretty important, but they're actually intuitive and help you to understand uh, machine learning really well. All right, so we are doing a classification model for finding guns in images posted on Facebook. So once again, it can be very complex to start thinking about this, or you simply say, okay, what is X and what is Y? Okay, so you start with that procedure just to simplify how you start to think about all the things that you need. All right, so again, we want to start uh, with the easy things. Some things are easy to uh, visualize. So a classification model. We've got inputs and we've got outputs uh, for finding guns and images posted on Facebook. So what do we know? How many classes? Two, gun, no gun, right? Once it's, So this is similar to the previous one. That's pretty easy. Gun, no gun. Now the images can be of anything, right? So this is one, one, this is zero, okay? So we know that. So once again, we can populate this one, one, zero, zero, one, one. All right. Now we think of N. We think of M here, right? And how are we going to do this? So uh, it's Facebook. So they get a lot of images, correct? So how many images? 300,000. 300, yeah, for Facebook, that's in a day probably, yeah. right? So 300,000. Okay. And here is 300,000, perfect. What else we need, do we need? We need features, features, which is gonna be your F1, F2, F3, dot, 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 until Fm, and we need uh, samples. What is the sample? 
one picture is a sample. So that's easy here, right? There's that this is a very easy one. So we've got samples. Sample one, sample two, all the way to sample 300,000. What are the features? Yeah, go ahead. The size of the image. Okay. Uh, I don't know if there's a software that can see the colors of the image. Mm -hmm. uh, if there is a face recognition software. So let's just the... buy a whole bunch of machine learning yeah. software and use it on our machine. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good one. Yeah, go ahead. So like Okay. Like what? What do you mean by that? I guess like for each pixel, there's associated RGB value to it. Mm -hmm. which just counts how many are the same, group them together. Okay. Um, and if there's like a ratio, like one color sticks out more. Mm -hmm. Probably like flag or something. Flag it. Okay. Okay. A lot of image processing. Yeah. Go ahead. So maybe um, since you're getting the data from Facebook, you know who posted like. Email, email, ah, so you're actually saying my input is not just images, but metadata. That's not a bad idea. Yeah, good. So, so is met, would metadata count as a feature? You can, yeah. yeah. You can do whatever you want. You're, you're building this. So if you have it, you use it. Oh, you can use it. Yeah, go ahead. The, the what? The comments. That can also be. So now you have images. So this is a... Uh, Location, yeah, so that's metadata, maybe. Oh, this is called now multimodal, all right? So you guys have a mo you know, mode, which is images, but you also have metadata, and you have comments, which is language. So you're bringing all of this together, okay? You see that? That's great. All of those are great. I would say, well, I, I know this because I've seen it, but the approach, one approach that people just use is just to think of the image, right? So we need to answer one question. Are these color images or black and white images? What do you want them to be? Because you can make them black and white if they're color. But are you losing data if you make them black and white? Is it relevant to the problem to keep them as color images or would black and white also work? So you want to keep color images. Okay. So that means you mentioned something about RGB, right? So what that means is when you have, and this we'll see this a lot, when we have an image, right? We have one grid, and that's what you know, one one channel, let's say, in black and white. But if you have color, you need to have three grids of the same size. So that's gonna be your RGB. So you basically have, if you think of this as a matrix that is size 28 by 28, for instance, right? In black and white, that's all you need. But in color, you would have that three times, one for the R, one for the G, one for the B, and those get combined to create an image. So that's the representation of an image, okay? Which is R. They're matrices, yeah. This is a matrix. This is a matrix of, let's say, 28 by 28 by three. So you have data in, in those three dimensions, which are the three channels. So that's what I was saying. You Do you want that, or do you just want one like this. So it might just depend on what's better, right? If you can do color, probably do color, right? But if that's too expensive, you know, for whatever reason, you can start with black and white and see how it works and then try the color. It, it, those are decisions you have to make. If you notice though, I have, I want to know the size of the images. The, the, the images are in fact on Facebook, you know, people have phones, they have cameras, whatever they, and so they're going to have different size images. Machine learning, however, does not like different size images, right? You've seen that, hopefully you've started to notice this already, that when in the previous example, I said 40 here, and I said 100,000 by 40, it means every sample has, a, has 40 columns. Do you see that? You can have some rows that have 40 and others that have 35. Machine learning will not work that way. Okay, why is that? That's actually a very important question because what machine learning is doing is, let's say it takes column three and what it's actually looking for, it's the differences between all the samples. So it wants to find a pattern that for some reason, sometimes these are high values and these are low values. 
You see, so you need to have all of those columns there and they need to be the exact size. Every sample needs to have the same number of features. Is that clear, guys? Okay. So then you have a problem with images from Facebook, which will be different of different sizes. So a simple solution is just to make them the same size, either by picking a shape like 226 by 226 and padding it or cropping the images if they're larger to, to a dimension like 226 by 226. You see that? Or it could be, you know, our first examples will be actually 28 by 20. Henry, do you have a question? Would like, yes. like um, say you have an image the size X, wouldn't just making, say, like an image kind of size Y, just express it in terms of like a scalar, to just remove the scalar away? To where like, it's not, they're all, not all the same size or whatnot. You want them to all be the same size once they go into that's what I'm saying. No, you don't they need to have the same number. So if you have remember, so one thing that's gonna happen here, just to simplify things, let's define what a sample is, right? So maybe you guys will see it that way. So we said a sample is an image, right? So in our previous example, the an image was a row, right? So then if we want it, that's all we know right now. Later on, we can see other examples we can act that actually take images as a whole, as a square thing. But here, all we know is that we've defined samples as rows, and then we said that the features were these columns for each row. So we've done 40, or we've done other numbers, right? So that means that I have to take my image, whatever it is, and fit it into a row for, for this, what I know of machine learning so far. So one simple way of doing that is, Let's imagine I have color images. So I have R, G, B, right? I stack them, right? But all the three layers. So this is the R, the G, and the B. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I call this spaghettify. You spaghettify this thing. Imagine like you grab a uh, clothes and you take the two strings and, you know, pull it. So spaghettify it. So basically, you spaghettify it in that direction and that direction so that it becomes one vector. Another way of saying this is to grab, you grab this one and now you concatenate them. The next one, concatenate it, the next one and so on. And you keep concatenating it. And obviously it's gonna be the same value. So a simple example, let's say I, I ignore the, well, let I define these images all to be 28 by 28, right? Then if I spaghettify this, it's going to be 784, right? Do you guys agree? 28 by 28. So I have 28 rows, each having 28 features, right? Which are pixels in this case, by the way. So then this becomes a vector of size 784. Since I have RGB, it's 784 times 3. And that's the vector. Do you guys see that? This is the simplest scenario that you can take. So we're saying that every pixel is what in this case then? A feature. Do you see that? But but for this to work, all images need to be the same size. So you're gonna have to resize it. Got it? Yeah. So because again, what's really important, as I said of machine learning, every sample F3 needs to be pixel three, right? Because what it's trying to learn is what's the difference when I see class zero and I look at pixel or, or feature three, you know, what what are the values there, you know, versus the values on when I see class one, the, the other class. It's trying to learn the differences. You know, for instance, a, a, another example of that, let's say that I have feature F4, right? But all the values are one for whatever reason. They're all one. You had 300,000 samples. So for feature F4, all the values are one. Is that a useful feature or something that you should throw out? Throw out, right? Because it tells the machine learning algorithm absolutely nothing. What's the point of knowing that every, it's like saying, you know, all of you have a hat and it's the same hat. What's the point of that? I don't learn anything from that. I learn in, I learn information from the differences, not from things that are similar. You see that? So this is really important, okay? So if I take an image that's RGB and I spaghettify it, Q 
can I now, do I now know the, the size of M? What is that? It's three by 784, right? So that's the size for M. That's the number of features that I have in this scenario. Does this make sense, guys? What's one benefit of this approach is that I'm not losing any information. If you guys you guys had these ideas of let's take the ratio of something or I don't know what other things you said, but let's look at this and that. What's the problem with that? You're making assumptions, right? That, okay, I need this information and I'm going to throw away everything else. Whereas if you do this, you're giving it the whole image. And you let the machine learning algorithm actually find patterns that maybe you as a human would not be able to. Got it? Does this make sense? All right, so let's kind of summarize then where we are. So let's think uh, over here. Again, we wanna say what is X and what is uh, Y here. So let's plug in the dimension. So we said this is 300,000 because it's Facebook. We have a lot of these. We know that these are zeros and ones because it's a simple classification problem. This is F1, F2. And we know that FM, because it's RGB, each is 28 by 28. So that's spaghettified as 784. And then we stack all three. So M is three times 784, whatever that number is. And that's your own. Every pixel. So and then the, the samples over here are images. So this is an image. This is an image. Every image has feature F3 which corresponds to pixel three, right? In the R channel. That's all for all of them is the R channel and for all of them is the third pixel of the seventh row, whatever. Because it it, the machine learning algorithm wants to see how that value changes across the classes. Did we answer all the questions? What are you gonna use the pixels for though? What do you mean? What am I? Like, are you gonna be looking at a, a drawing picture before, and you're gonna match pixels to it, or no? That's a that's a good question. Actually, I'm not gonna do that. The machine learning algorithm is gonna do that for me. So it has a data set for the guns already. It does not need that. What it has is it has classes. So machine learning can do this. That's the whole point of this. You just frame the problem, and you let the algorithm find the pattern. You see what I'm saying? Because let, let's see if, 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 if this works, right? So it's a good, I like your question, actually. So you've got an image, right? Uh, three by 784, you got another image, you got another image, and then you've got zero, zero, one, right? This, this is the label. So you need, remember, this is supervised learning. So you definitely need to know which images for the, we're trying, okay, so let me say this. We're trying to build a model that will find guns in pictures, right? But before we, and we're gonna deploy that, but before we deploy that model, we have to train it. So we have to have a training set where maybe Facebook hired people, right? Such as yourself to look at images and say, there's a gun there. There's not a gun here. You see that? So this is a requirement for supervised learning. But the, the key thing about this is Facebook will get 10 million images per month, maybe. But you don't have to train a model with 10 million images. You just do it with maybe 10,000 images. And then the model will be good enough to be deployed and find guns. So that's a good question, right? So this is a supervised learning problem. So we need to have a data set of the images, and then we ne this needs to be very good, like very correct. So usually this was done by a human, by a person. They went in and they said, maybe they flag it, right? So there's that thing where, you know, on Facebook, uh, you can flag some, right? So then somebody flags it, it goes to like a person that says, oh yeah, it's it was flagged because there's a gun. So now it marks it as a gun, and now you have this data set. So assuming we have this, and this is really good. So 
you know, we have an image and we have that it, there's no gun. We have an image, there's no gun. And then we have an image and there is a gun. After that, we don't have to do anything. We, we only have to give it the pixels and we the machine learning algorithm is going to try to do what? It's going to try to say, what is the difference in these images when they have something that's a zero versus what is the difference in these images when they have something that's a one? You see, it's looking for that thing that is common to zero, but not common to the ones. That's the pattern recognition. What is that? For us humans, we're, we want to say there's something that looks metallic, square shaped, looks like a gun, right? But because we know these things, but to the computer, it may be just something else, sharp edges, things like that. And that's, you, you, you will agree that that's in the pixels. Because when we look at the image, we would immediately know there's a gun there, right? So the pixels do have that. And the algorithm just tries to learn that itself. So we don't need to do more things like, just give me a sec, like a function that says, I found a trigger or something, like that, right? That That's not necessary. Yeah, go ahead. Um, would, so would, would it be a bad idea then to give it kind of like a control image like that? Like this is a picture of a gun, like as a starting point, or is it just by giving it the feature, pixels of a feature a model, it will, you're just gonna let it, discern that pattern for you time. let it discern the pattern that's i would recommend that that's okay. the because other the other one is called feature engineering and that's difficult to do it's very expensive to develop these functions that find specific things in an image this is what people used to do in the past but nowadays you just give it the pixels but you definitely have to give it the labels right that's really the key thing and somebody like Facebook is the only one that can really develop these models because they have massive amounts of data. You do need a lot of data. But at the end of the day, what the model is trying to do, as I said, is it may be that you know features F1 through F7 don't really provide any information, but there might be feature 11 where for no gun, the value is always seven this is just an example okay it's always seven but when you have a gun this value is always 65 always 65 you see that that's what it's going to pick up it's going to say like hmm when that it's so what is that we call that in in in, in our normal daily lives correlations right we have a tendency to correlate things right you guys correlate right now that it's cold, it's gonna be, uh, there's a storm coming, so you're correlating, it's gonna be slippery, could be accidents, right? Immediately, you're correlating those things. So that's the same thing with machine learning. It's looking for, if if these are all three, and this is three, and this is three, that's not useful for the machine learning model. But if this is always seven, or an average of seven, and this is always an average of 65, that's the feature that's useful. Yes, please. Uh, is it true if you have a, a identical model with 10 features versus like 30 features? Yeah. They produce the same result, the one with less features is better? Or does this not really matter? It's better in the sense that it consumes less memory, right? Because this is, you know, if, if I had three, okay, so this is actually a good question. Three times 784 is actually really large. If and so this data set, what is three times seven eighty four? Do you guys have that number? It's like two thousand something. Two thousand two three five two. Two three five two. Is that what you said? Yeah, two three five two. Two three five two. Think about this matrix. This is three hundred thousand times two three five two. That's what you have to load in memory. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, that's really large for your laptop. When when we do CIFAR 10, for instance, it's 60,000 by about the same because, because it's uh, CIFAR 10, I think it's 32 by 32 RGB. And you will see how slow it is to for the machine learning algorithm to learn. So this takes us to the point that there's a limit to how big images can be uh, when we train machine learning algorithms. For instance, you can't give them like 4K images. There's no way that it's going to learn with something like that. 
So usually I think the standard right now is 300 by 300, and that's big. That's what you want your image to be, 300 by 300. So you're going to shrink it as much as possible. You see what I'm saying? And this, this for your laptops, this is going to be limited. This is why we need GP. There we go. Yeah, go ahead. Just to kind of think yeah, about that. please. Models that are exactly the same. One has less features. Yes. Where, maybe this doesn't make sense. Where, where is like the cutoff point where would you want to use the one with less features, or are you running the risk of potentially eliminating a feature that might be? Yeah, I see. I see where, your point. Where you get the later on when in, in about week three, we're going to look at the tool set called Weka, and one of the things that I'll show you there is how to do feature ranking. So when you have a data set like this one, right, you load the data set into Weka. And what Weka will do is it'll do a feature ranking based on an algorithm, right? It's called mutual information algorithm. But what it's going to do is it's going to say feature F, what was this, 11? Feature F11 is ranked number one. That's the most important feature for this problem. And remember I said from F1 to F7, I said those were not useful. So when those are ranked, it'll say F1, F2, all the way to F7, they have basically a value of zero. So you can actually cut them off. So what's great about that is you don't have to worry about this problem. I would say start with the larger one. I think it was 20. If work it, your way down. yeah, and work your way down. If it, the, the only limiting factor is memory. You guys will see this. It, uh, as we progress in the class, things will run on your laptop first, then it'll take two hours, then overnight, then the people that have GPUs will win everything. <laughs> you know, because it, it just, as the data gets bigger, it, you know, there are limits to what we can process, okay? And there's some strategies that we can uh, use, such as something called PCA, which is a compression type of a technique or feature ranking, et cetera. Um, so, but, but anyway, uh, my point was we definitely don't want images that are too big. We will start with images that are 28 by 28. A lot of the pre-trained models like ResNet assume images that are 226 by 226. So you have to take your images and convert them into that size, whether it's cropping, padding, however you do it, but you want to fit it into these specific sizes. This is a, at least today in, in, in deep learning. This is required because, just give me a sec, it's the GPU is the thing that's limiting, right? So GPUs are matrix multiplications, right? That's what they are. So they have like fixed sizes that they expect for their operations. And to be efficient, you have to be like, you have to follow those those uh, conditions. What's your question? Maybe this is a dumb question. No, 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 go ahead. If you're limiting the size for each image, yeah. does that model then, how does that model then apply that to once it's learned everything, how does it apply to images that are bigger or smaller? You have to make those of the size of 226 by 226. So that's what I'm saying. Like Facebook develop, let, let's say this model, right, of guns. So this is Facebook's model of guns. So one condition of this model is that the inputs need to be 226 by 226. So when all the images that all of you load, some of you load 4K, 5K, whatever, they're going to be made into 226 by 226. Oh, they're just going to be made into it. They're going to be made into it. Yeah. You, right. We have tools. Uh, Torch Vision is just literally for that. It's like a tool set of Torch that is for image processing. So you can literally just say reshape to 226 by 226 through this transform of padding or whatever it is. But yeah, this is a requirement today because... The GPU to be efficient needs to be able to process matrices and vectors of specific dimensions. It can't be, oh, this is an image of this, so I need to make all these changes and then make this multiplication. It needs to be quick. Got it? But yeah, that, that's kind of how it is. Any other questions? Did this problem make sense? All right, this is an image problem. Several of the problems we will look at will be image uh, problems, okay? All right, I think we have time for one more, right? So let's do one more. Uh, so let's go back to the, uh, yeah, here. All right, so again, same pipeline, 
but we've done an image one. We did one uh, on Tuesday of predicting two values. Uh, we've also done the network one. So I'm trying to think of a different one that doesn't require too much um, like assumptions, too many assumptions. So you want to do the recommender system? Is that the one you're saying, the Netflix one? Or which one do you mean? Yeah, I think that's the one. I would All right, so let's think of number three. This is actually a very important, right, for any business. Um, recommending the right thing. You could be right now listening to this class and you get a recommendation of the thing that you just knew you wanted to buy but couldn't remember. And boom, you're going to click on that and buy it, right? And that's money that goes into these companies. So... This is very important. All right, so let's think about this model. So this will be the last one. Um, a classification model for movie recommendations, such as Netflix. Okay, so this one's a little bit more challenging. Okay, we're gonna go here. Okay, so this is, I will, I'm still going to start with X and Y. Okay. This may not be in the end what the model looks like, but you start here, right? You want to start here, get some, because again, you can answer some questions really quickly, right? Easily. So a classification model, right? So it's a mod, this is X and Y. It's a model, right? Once again, it's got inputs, it's got outputs. Um, so model for movie recommendation, e.g. Netflix. All right. So what's, uh, how is this going to work? How do you guys want this to work? Yeah, go ahead. Um, probably like you probably want the, you know, wait, so what platform is this? Well, I think it's Netflix, Netflix, Netflix itself. Netflix, Netflix have like likes and dislikes. Yeah, they, they do. Like or, like, like, like or dislike ratio. Okay, okay, okay. But let's let's just stick with X and Y, right? So what are inputs and outputs here for this mod? Inputs would probably be yeah. movies, I guess. Okay. Duration, rating. Okay, okay. Specific. What's the output? Can Y be more than zero and one? Like, yes, it can. So I like the, where you're going with the this. Genres like one is the horror, two is thriller. And how is that useful to recommend a movie? Because then you would go with the genre. You so the user, so in your assumption, the user has to say, "I like science and comedy," or "I like romance and uh, suspense." Right? That's kind of what you're saying. So then. The model says this is a horror one. It labels it like that. And so those are just sent to the people that said they like horror. Is that? No, because that's what they do right now. Well, I'm just saying we have to define these assumptions. You may, you're right. I'm, I'm not. It's not, I mean, like uh, so when you make that account for them, you horror, the, it will show you horror. They also tell you this, what might you might like. Mm -hmm. Do other genres. Okay, okay, okay. So from zero to twenty, say genres. But you guys have to tell me what's the input. This is a model. You're training this model. You give it something, it gives me something. So what do you want it to give you? Would, would like recommending other genres be yeah, that's the recommendation? I don't know. You yeah, you can use genres to like predict what movie you yes. want to watch. But... Could you play like movies that you prefer like maybe like one and zero so movies you prefer to watch and movies you wouldn't prefer. okay so now you're making it specific to a person yeah, right yeah like based off of like genre what you watched previously stuff like that okay so, okay do you guys agree with that approach all right so hmm? you have to tell me what Probably it's like a model a model always has inputs and outputs. Probably between zero and one predicting. It's a, so a rating type yeah, of a, a situation. Rating, okay. Like, so this is, okay, okay. I'm we'll, going to keep going. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> okay, so let's start with output so that we, we have something here. Remember, this is what we're going to populate, put here, right, in this column. So you said a rating type of thing, so right? You just don't want, like, one movie. You want a list of 
So you probably want like... Now keep in mind, Henry, for instance, this model may produce some data and that data gets used to recommend movies through an additional step. So this might be a two-step process. Gotcha. So you don't have to put everything into the model here. You can simplify it by just saying, here maybe this just gives the rating and then we use that rating in another way later. You see what I'm yeah, saying? Would, would having the output be like just the confidence rate? How much would you recommend? You would like this movie? Yeah, like how, like, what, what percentage? like a percentage, I guess, would be. So okay, like, of what? Like, of, so based on all these factors, how much would you recommend this compared to the other movies? Okay. And the other reason have the same option to click in for right now, and it should probably just do this to recommend the second. Any other ideas? Any? It's a hard one, right? This is a tough one. I don't, I don't know how what I'm going to say would be applied. Yeah, yeah. Sure. But if, like, if you had this, the sample would just be movies and shows, however many Netflix has in their whole repertoire. Okay. Is that an instead input? Of, instead of going by genre, mm -hmm. if somebody watched this movie, what other movies did they watch with it? That's a good one. I like that. So that instead of getting recommendations by genre, you're getting, if somebody watched this movie, here's what they watched next. Or this is the other movies watched by, you know, if you finish a movie, other users watched these movies next. That would be the mm -hmm. I don't know how that would be applied, but. Okay. So. I kind of like that. So let me think about that. I'm going to, this could be all movies, right? This could be all, how, I don't know, 200,000 movies or however many movies there are. And you would just say for each one of these movies, um, this is the value of how likely you are to watch it. But that's a very big vector. So that's going to be difficult for a machine learning algorithm. So maybe let's just say genres, as you guys said. So this output vector is uh, genre. Right, John, oops, I think it's John Ross. Yeah. And, yeah. All right, so how many genres? Let's define that. Are there 10, 20? 10, all right, so that's 10 outputs. And we define, this is gonna be like suspense, this is action, romance, comedy, something like that, right? And then we have users. This is a user over here where they have preference. So they, you know, you've learned that they like suspense, action, don't like romance, don't like comedy. Do you see that? So then this model, if it predicts that this movie is like that, will not recommend it to the user. Does that make sense? But I think I have an eraser. If this movie comes out as one one zero zero, you recommend it, right? Because it it did a match. Do you see what I'm saying? So this is something that we can try. It may not be the right thing to do, right? But this is something that we can try. So then that's what we're trying to predict. And remember, it's not going to be necessarily ones and zeros. It could be 0 0.95, 0 0.80 but you're going to take whatever is the highest value that we're trying to learn. But at least we've defined something, right? We've got something here that there's 10 of these. So then now X and Y, what is this value here? 10. There are 10 columns as the output. Do you guys see that? Right? This is going to be N and this is going to be M. All right, so we need to now define for this model, you guys follow, right? So the, the idea is users have like preferences, right? Do you like suspense? Do you like romance? Do you like action, comedy? You've set those things and you rank that somehow like by zeros or ones. And then now the model obviously needs to say for every movie, what are the proportions of that? What is it exactly? So that it can either recommend it or not right. Okay. So then let's think of what is a sample. And the hard part here will be what are the features to use? 
Netflix actually had the Netflix challenge, which was like a competition for $1 million to whoever developed the best recommendation system. So you can imagine how people were incentivized to do that, right? But anyway, let's just think, how, what do we need for this to work? What is here a sample? A movie. Does that make sense for everyone? Maybe a movie. I think it makes sense. So sample equals a movie. Should I recommend this movie or should I not recommend? Keep in mind, you might get one movie that gets 0 0.70, 0 0.70, 0 0.40, 0 0.40, and then you get another movie that's 0 0.90, 0 0.90, 0 0.05, 0 0.05. Which one of those two do you recommend? 0 0.90, 0 0.05, right. So this system kind of works in that sense, right? You know how to, between two movies, I recommend the one that matches this profile a little bit better. Got it? All right, so we have a movie. We have a model that predicts these things. And now what are the features? Okay, this one, so this one, yeah, so this one's a little bit, it's different, right? Because here, it's, even though movies are images, they're sequences of movies, you're not gonna probably use that information, right? So it means that we're probably using either metadata about the movie, descriptions of the movies, or some other technique, right? So we need to, but regardless of how we would get that part of the data, let's just define some features here. So what, what do you think would be some features? F1, F2, and then you need to tell me definitely what M would be, like your estimate of how many of those you could collect. And you can disagree with this approach. You know, it's it's entirely, it's just, we're just looking at the procedure of how to get to this. Yeah. As you said, actors, uh, the length of the movie and where the movie Okay, is so located. Tom Cruise, you're saying. So if Tom Cruise is there, what type of a movie is it? Action, probably, right? Um, Will Ferrell writes comedy, yeah. comedy. All right, so actors might be a good indicator of this, right? So how do we make that into a feature? Okay, so an act, okay, like, uh, yes. Are we predicting the genre or what? We're predicting what movie to recommend. And there may be more efficient ways, more automated ways of collecting this data, right? So we're just thinking about it. Keep in mind, let, let's just think about this. All of you probably have Netflix. All of you probably, except Henry, of course. All of you go in and go, you know, you saw a movie and you said like, and you saw a, a comedy and you said you don't like it. All that data is recorded by Netflix. And believe me, they're going to use it both to train their model and to, to create your profile. They're, they've done it already, right? So there is that, but that getting that data from what you said was what you liked and it's a more complex procedure. You can do it, of course. There's actually something called singular value decomposition, which is actually the technique for doing it. Well, how is the date? The date? Yeah, the production. Yeah, like, like if it's Christmas time, but I want to work on Christmas. It's not how long it lasts. Or it's like a super old movie or a very like. So year. Okay, yeah. that's a, we can all agree on year when the movie yeah. was made, right? Okay, how about that? That could be a feature. I like that feature because, yeah, we can all agree on that one. Year when the movie was made. That's F1. So the movie was made in 1920 or it was made in the 90s or it was made in 20. 18 probably a marvel movie if it was made in 2018 right. yes animation is it animated or not is it animated or not yeah exactly so you just have a whole lot of metadata so this one can probably have a lot of features right do you guys see what i'm saying so this one's a little bit more challenging because you really want to have all these features in there right and so we can keep doing this but Let's think of a number. So what do you think M would be? Year of the movie. Um, act if we set actors, like if a column was Tom Cruise, one or zero, 
and then Will Ferrell, one or zero. And um, what's another one? Jim Carrey, it was a comedy, right? Imagine it says Will, if Will Ferrell and Jim Carrey are both in the movie, that's like crazy, you know, funny movie, right? So it, yeah, that's a, those are features that could be useful. And so you could put all the actors, could be like a thousand actors, right? And you could put the year, that's one feature. You could put the length of the movie, animated, not animated, um, you know, if you go to IMDB, right, that place where they have movie information, you could, maybe there's a database of IMDB. I am pretty sure actually there is. I'm pretty sure there is. You can get that database and you have all that data for the movies. So just use that. That's what I would tell you right now. Yeah, go ahead. Probably season seven. It would seem more. If you, if you have the data, you can use it, yeah. I guess like before I'm like, Say like traffic of like say this movie gets a lot of traction this season. Would that be a way to Yeah, if it if it's if it's in the metadata somehow and and all movies have that feature, you can use it. Now what you don't want is for some movies to have that feature and others not that don't have it. Because if you put a zero there, the machine learning algorithm is going to believe something else that maybe it's you know, the feature does exist, but it's a zero, right? And you don't want that. Whenever you choose a feature, it has to be present for all samples. Because remember, it's learning differences between the, the different classes. You guys understand? Okay. All right. So anyway, so this is a much, it's a, it, this actually can be done in many, many other ways. Okay. We may come back to this topic uh later in the semester because there is a technique actually for this called singular value decomposition and it's just a technique that you can use for it but for this example uh we've defined this this could be a lot just if we had all the actors it's like a thousand so let's say this is four thousand different features because we can get all this data per movie from imdb something like that all right how many movies would Netflix have? Probably all the movies they own or whatever it is. So I don't know. Let's say there's 300,000. So this is 300,000. And then we're predicting 10 things here, right? So again, this is a supervised learning problem. So how do we get these values? To train the model. Remember that eventually we deploy the model on new things. Guys, guys, Henry. <laughs> you can build your recommender later. All right. So um, remember that we're building models so that next this year, 2024, we can make recommendations. Right. But obviously the model needs to be trained on some data. Right. So that's going to be our train set of, let's say, 300,000 by 40,000, 4,000, and then 300,000 by 10. However, we still have one more problem. How do we get these values. How do we get that for the movie um, Top Gun, right? That, you know, that the 10 values here, how do we get that? Manually labeling is the sim simplest solution. Now, Netflix can probably afford to hire 300,000, some people yeah. to label 300,000 movies. Because remember, you definitely want this data to be like perfect. Okay, if there's errors in this, the machine learning algorithm will learn those errors as well, right? So garbage in, garbage out, right? So you don't, you, this needs to be like building this data set is really important, okay? Does that make sense, guys? So this is, at the end of the day, it's not so much about the recommender system because really I can tell you, as I've said a couple of times already, there's a very specific uh, tool for this uh, called singular value decomposition that really gives you all this information. And this is the approach that is taken for recommender systems. But in general, all I wanted was to cover this um, basic approach of how to get X and Y so you can start thinking about your problem. Okay. Questions? All right. So this it's 731. So, we'll, you know, uh, what we can uh, stop here. 
All right, you have three problems that we did, three word problems. If you have questions on uh, Tuesday, we can do another one. Uh, since I don't wanna rush, let's hold off on the Anaconda environment. I'll, I'll demo that on Monday. Please install Anaconda on your laptops and then I will show you how to create the environment and install some of the libraries and we'll start with NumPy on Tuesday. Also look for the homework uh, tomorrow. Okay, I will create three problems and I'll, I will post them on Brightspace for you to solve. Ah, I passed around the, the attendance. Oh, yeah, never got it. Back to yeah. Time, so. All right, guys, so we can stop here, uh, drive safe, and I'll see you guys on Tuesday.